Hello, everyone. I am Katie Donahue. I am the editor in chief of Whitewall Magazine and co founder of Art Mamas Alliance. On behalf of Whitewall, I would like to welcome you to the fifth annual Lexus Art Series Art and Innovation Talks by Whitewall with Design Miami. And to our panel today, Creativity and Transition Looking at the Role of Art and Design in Relation to Motherhood and Family. Hi, uh, my name is Helen Tuma. I am also, I'm Katie's co-founder in Art Mamas Alliance, and we're incredibly excited to be moderating this wonderful panel today. Quick intro on Art Mamas Alliance. This was started um, last year and kind of blossomed this year really as a support group to, um, to support uh, magical parents in the arts during this incredibly difficult time. So thank you for having us panelists and Katie, you're going to introduce these wonderful people. Yes, today we are so excited to have you here. Michelle Miller Fisher is the Ronald C. and Anita L. Warnick Curator of Contemporary Decorative Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and one half of Designing Motherhood, the popular Instagram account and soon to be book and exhibition. Isolde Brielmeyer is the inaugural curator at large at the International Center of Photography in New York and the author of the recently published Culture as Catalyst and Laura Appleton, the founder of Kinder Modern and the Female Design Council. Uh, at the top, we wanted to acknowledge that uh, a few of us have experienced motherhood and uh, Michelle's research is deeply rooted in motherhood. So we wanted to kind of start out with a initial question of how motherhood for each of you was treated in your field when you began your career. Who wants to take that? I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, and so nice to be here. Thank you, Katie and Helen uh, for reaching out and Laura and Michelle. It's so nice to be in your company, the company of fierce women. Um, you know, that's an interesting question, because I think when I was sort of coming up in the contemporary art world, um, I don't actually think that motherhood was really on my mind. Um, but what I did notice, and, and just to sort of go a step back, some of you know that I come out of the, the, the dance world. I'm a, um, a former dancer. Um, and in that world, motherhood was not really encouraged. Uh, I know things have shifted a little bit, but that was um, very much the sort of tone. Um, we talked about being dancers. We talked about keeping our bodies as is and keeping our focus, um, you know, on the feet. And so I, that was sort of my first sort of recollection of realizing that um, as, a, as a person and as a young woman, I could be doing something that I was incredibly passion, passionate about, throwing my sort of heart and soul into it, but that there were certain sort of unspoken no-nos. Uh, in the art world, it's, it, it was very different. Um, it's, it, not everything is predicated upon your physical body, right? Um, and we know that motherhood takes everything, <laughs> everything imaginable kind of of and from and you know, with your physical body. Um, but one thing I did notice was that a lot of the women artists uh, whom I really admired or whose careers I was sort of introduced to early on and would just sort of follow them, many of them did not have kids. Uh, and, you know, obviously, you know, when you're 19, you sort of, you know, you make note of certain things and now sort of moving into the forties, you kind of think about, wow, was that a choice or was that really about being, um, a woman artist within the kind of power structures and confines of what was then a very rigid contemporary art world. So that's kind of a, a multi, you know, it's a multi-tiered answer to your question, but I think um, that sort of lack of awareness or sort of thought that I really gave to the topic has clearly evolved. Um, and so too, I think uh, the art world uh, has as well. So I'll speak to motherhood at this uh, stage of my career, if you will, which was when I entered into this most recent um, furniture design landscape. Having children was seemingly looked at as a negative. It was always, a, oh, or a glaze over. And I think launching Kinder Modern and having this gallery and focus purely on families and the development of children in relationship to those works. There was intrigue to a point, but still if 
someone didn't have children or didn't like children, which I came across very often, there was a real adverse reaction, uh, which was always surprising to me because even before I became a mother, I was kind of fascinated with women that were able or seemingly able to do that dance and that juggle. So I've worked really hard, I think, to help people recognize how incredible it is to have a family, however that folds out for you, and how that weaves in and out of your professional life is also, while tricky, um, and a bit of a constant non-balance, um, it's still a wonderful thing. So I really appreciate being amongst a team of professional mothers who are doing it amazingly. I second everything that you both have said. Um, the beginning of my career happened in Scotland. And so structurally, it's very different there. I was 22 when I left and came here, but, and it's absolutely no paradise there by any means, but um, healthcare is a human right. Education is a human right. And there are things like, you know, better, not universal, but better access to childcare at cheaper rates. And so um, thinking about how motherhood was treated in my field, at least structurally at a, at a social level, it was just more possible to have a family life and have that supported to a certain extent by the state. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about in our field because so often art labor is seen as somehow exceptional. You do it because you love it. And that's a different type of labor than other types of labor, which of course we know is completely incorrect. It's labor like anything else. That's why people are unionizing now because we understand that it's important to um, treat this as work and get paid a, a, a living wage for it. Um, and so I, I think it's important to think sort of structurally, not only how our field treats it, but how the rest of the social structures in the US treat it, because that I think is um, the, the, the reason that we find it so difficult to have a family life, whatever we might call a family life um, in the art world. Michelle, do you think, because I obviously identify um, my family, Scottish and English and, uh, you know, a Brit abroad and all that jazz. Do you feel like um, you being kind of like an, an immigrant has uh, kind of spurred this interest? Because I'm just wondering where the interest came from in terms of designing motherhood and it being your, your passion, you know? Yeah, that's a really good question. In a nutshell, it came from being raised by a single parent. I've always been really interested in labor rights. Um, I watched my mom go from earning more than my dad and going back to work six weeks after having me, six weeks after having my sister, six weeks after having my brother. My grandfather had a stroke. She then became the carer of a disabled person and three infants. And she never regained the agency that she once had in terms of her earning power, especially once she became divorced. My father was not a great person. And so she ended up um, you know, being a matriarch and a head of a household. And I'm so proud that that's the way I grew up because I had this very strong example. But um, she left school at 15. She didn't have qualifications. And so um, for me, being able to control my reproductive arc to a certain extent, but also coming up against systems here where it's absolutely beyond my control. It's a divergent, like I can, and my co-partner on Designing Motherhood is a wonderful, amazing friend and, and design historian too, Amber Winnick. I got my job at MoMA the um, year she found out she was pregnant with her first child. We've had this, like we do this together because we were two halves of the same coin. She's been able to have two amazing girls. There's no way I would have been a curatorial assistant with children at MoMA. Like that was in no planet was that ever going to happen. That's why no child, no curatorial assistant at MoMA ever had kids. Um, and actually the only person I saw did it then had to leave. Um, so I think it's less about the, um, place I come from, although I think then when you know a different paradigm is possible, it becomes very attractive to interrogate why it doesn't happen here. Um, but more because um, I just, yeah, I'm totally fascinated by the confluence of gender, uh, reproductive power, labor, and agency. Notion of, you mentioned this notion of systems, because really at the end of the day, we know that culture, right, plays a huge role um, but culture is and is not supported by systems, right? Systems and structures of power are often oppressive. So when we as women and as mothers um, and uh, humans who just in general like children and support families um, exist, work, um, engage within systems that are supportive of that, um, it, it, becomes, it, it becomes so much easier then to kind of create a culture, right? Around which a single mother 
can have three children. I don't know how she came back after six weeks. Please go give her, you know, my massive, massive um, shout outs. Um, but it becomes, it becomes, she's supported, right? If, if, if all of that can shift, because we're really talking about something that's systemic and structural. And when we talk about the creative space of art and design, it's really the micro of the macro, right? In the US, we talk about a system that supports family. We talk about health insurance. We talk about, uh, but we really don't have, sorry, we talk about a culture, right? But we don't have systems that actually um, uphold those ideals. Um, and so, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of like the structural change really has to um, happen in order to sometimes change attitudes and culture, but also to support attitudes and culture, say of the five of us here, right, that are all, we're already very forward thinking in this space, so that we know we can be met, right, with the support that we need. So I so, just so spot on. And I, I, we've come, we've, we've come a certain amount. <laughs> but I still think, um, that we've got, you know, we definitely have a ways to go. One last point also is we don't visually get to see those options. You don't often see representation around you because there's potential distaste or um, unsupportive behavior in professional capacities. We don't get to see it in our professional networks either. And so it's really hard if you can't see something how do you mimic it? How do you build it? How do you, you know, architect a life to support a family without having those um, visual structures previously? So I think we're all in our own way. What was I interesting about um, the three of us is we are architecting that visual. And I think, you know, everyone on this call is really doing that in support of motherhood and families. So I'm really excited about that. Laura, I'm also curious to hear from you and Michelle and Asolda as well, but also, you know, working specifically in a space that addresses childhood, what, and you touched upon this a little bit, but what kind of were those reactions? Because in the design world, we don't always think of that umbrella of designing for that younger age, this, this kind of transition time in, in a family life. So what was that like for you? Well, I think that previously design for children in our country specific and in terms of current times has very much been disposable. It has been, okay, lots of plastic, lots of cheaply made goods that we will then get rid of. And for me, it was really important to unearth and share this historical background of lifetime furniture that was used in so many different capacities that started with architects who were designing for schoolhouses that then were designing for need. Um, and so when I started Kinder Modern, I really highlighted this niche that a lot of people in design specifically weren't even familiar with. So there was a bit of intrigue at first of like, ooh, what is that? And, and kind of almost aggravation that they didn't know. And then a bit of um, ongoing, there was a contingency of people who were not interested and were very um, kind of, wishy-washy or just completely rude about it. Oh, that's for kids, that must not be cool. Or I get a lot because the designs are very, for lack of a better word, fashion forward and really unique form. That's not for kids, you know, a lot of patronization. But then when I exhibited the overall response from general public, whether they're in design or creativity at all, was such an incredible interest of a mix of nostalgia, you know, from the older generations. Obviously, the younger generations were, you know, swarm and attracted to these forms and what they are. Um, and so it's been a really interesting ride and I was also living it you know I had a baby at home and that's when I started my gallery where I was raising um you know in my apartment with our staff and you know building this structure with the family right there and um for me it just fueled me to share more learn more and share more and help people understand that living with families is an incredible thing and that people do it in different ways all over the world. And I wanted to unearth the importance of those developmental points and how the made goods around you support those moments, uh, both for the family and the children. 
and then the afterlife of those pieces, you know, the heirlooms, the lifetime pieces. What you just said about supporting the moment like leads on perfectly to Michelle in terms of your research um, in, in, in terms of designing motherhood, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll try and keep it succinct because it's something I'd love to talk about all day. Um, uh, it really actually ties to what Laura was saying in terms of um, visualizing things. When Amber and I started this project about four years ago, we looked around us and we couldn't see in collections that we were working with. I was at MoMA at the time. We couldn't see in design history survey textbooks. I was teaching at Parsons at the time. We really couldn't see anywhere apart from maybe uh, specialized collections like medical museums or elements of the Smithsonian's collection, anything to do with the arc of human reproduction. And I remember making an argument to my brilliant supervisor at MoMA at the time saying, you know, if machine art, which was the first design exhibition that ever happened at, at moment, 1934, if Alfred Barr and um, Philip Johnson had been anyone else, they might actually have put a breast pump in there because it absolutely fit into the MoMA typology of labor-saving device made mostly by men, but for women, looked like a technological marvel. I could make an airtight design history, canonical design history argument for this um, material culture and yet it hadn't in 90 years shown up anywhere in the record um, and, and this type of material culture had become not just like the standard at MoMA but MoMA had set that standard for a lot of other conversations that were happening within modern and contemporary design and um, that was acknowledged and yet there just was no place for it at MoMA um, and not for lack of support from my direct supervisor who is amazing not from interest lack of interest um, and so that's when we decided to put a book proposal together to look at the arc of human reproduction through the lens of design so looking at the choice or lack thereof to um, have uh, children right the way through pregnancy birth and postpartum we started it um, and uh, sent out a book proposal to many publishers Chris Hudson the wonderful director of publishing at MoMA was kind enough to look over our proposal so we knew it was like strong enough he said it's a great proposal and we sat back rubbing our hands with glee thinking oh my goodness we're going to get so many people wanting to publish this book for us crickets absolutely nothing um, and so we we're like you know what we'll just do it ourselves we're going to publish it ourselves and a couple of years later, after Me Too and Time's Up and a lot of other social movements had happened after the New York Times put a parenting section um, together, in a week actually, about, yeah, about a year and a half ago, we suddenly got uh, three emails from three different publishers saying, oh, you know that proposal that you had? We actually think it'd be really interesting if women told their own stories. And we were like, no shit, of course it would. That's what we told you a long time ago. We'd be really delighted to meet with you though. And so um, that's where the project came from. And it's a good teamwork makes the dream work project. So we're working with Maternity Care Coalition who have been doing this work on the ground as culturally appropriate care workers in Philly for the last four years um, UPenn so it's a design curriculum intervention where we teach designers about this material um, it'll be at uh, two spaces in Philly but we hope it will travel as well and it will also be a book that is so so exciting and I know like I think all of us are followers of the account I think the location in the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia like could not be the most it's like the most epic location for anyone who's who's been there um but I I think I would love to kind of talk about so much that's already come up is is this idea of accessibility and visibility just kind of making this thing more visible and the work that all of you do is really rooted in that whether it's just addressing that these are design objects or whether it's motherhood or children, or Isolde in your curatorial practice with your book culture as catalyst, it's kind of bringing these conversations, some of them may be difficult, these cultural conversations to light and bring what artists do to light. And also I think uh, really to a much wider audience. So I'd love to sort of hear um, how your work in the museum space, in public arts, um, at places like Westfield, things like that at ICP, inspired the work or the book Culture as Catalyst? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's so interesting, you guys. I think, uh, I mean, for me at the root of, of who I am as a, a cisgendered Black woman in the U.S., um, uh, visibility, representation, the amplification of, of voices, uh, not necessarily my own, but others um, who look like me and who have uh, been sort of disenfranchised and marginalized. I mean, that's really at the core of my curatorial practice, of my scholarly practice. Um, and I tend also to sort of gravitate towards artists 
um, who are of like mind and who are very concerned about these, these issues. Um, so uh, accessibility is, is right up there, um, you know, making sure that um, the work that I do, the collaborations that I do with artists to create platforms that honor, honor their vision do provide multiple points of entry for a broad range of visitors and viewers. Um, that is paramount to me. Uh, and as is the sort of strong focus on, on audience. And so Katie, you hit the nail on the head in a way, because I came out of museums. I started at the Guggenheim and went to the Bronx and then I was chief curator at SCAD. And when I came back from SCAD, I kind of realized I still very much wanted to work with artists and really maintain um, you know, those core values that I just mentioned, but I wanted to do it in a very non-traditional space uh, that might allow me and the artists with whom I work um, kind of capture that accidental audience, that audience that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, expect to engage with artwork or engage with artists, right? Which is very different when you're going to a museum, right? When you go to the Met or the Louvre or the Prado, you're going to see art. Um, so working at the Oculus at World Trade Center is very similar. It's a transportation hub at the end of the day. Um, so anything that you put in there is really sort of surprising and kind of unexpected. Uh, so yeah, accessibility is a huge piece in there for me. And then also really thinking about uh, the power of art and the power of the image. Um, Mark Seeley, who is the director of Autograph in London, who I'm a huge fan of, really put it well uh, in a recent conversation we had. He said he's less interested in all of the kind of theory stuff um, which, you know, probably a lot of us can do. I can tell you a lot about what Freud might think about an image, but I'm kind of not that interested in that. I'm more interested in what kind of work is the image, is art doing in culture? What kind of work is it doing? How is it shifting how we see things, right? Wh where's the social impact, the political impact, right? The impact on, you know, whether it's criminal justice, gender, LGBTQIA, um, you know, perceptions and representation. So the idea for the book, Culture as Catalyst, it was sort of three years in the making and it came out of a series of conversations that I had when I was curator at large at the Tang Museum at Skidmore, uh, where I was interested in, I happen to, and I know that probably all of you feel the same way, I happen to feel artists are incredibly special human beings and they really exist in the world and see the world very differently. Uh, and so I was interested in pairing artists with activists, journalists, um, scholars, uh, and, and creating conversations around some of the most kind of potent, they were potent back then and, and definitely potent now, issues of our time. So these included, and I wanted to come at it from a different angle, right? So rather than talk about race, um, that particular conversation focused on whiteness and marking whiteness. Right, this idea that whiteness sort of moves through the world unmarked without a passport, and you can't talk about race without talking about whiteness. So we had a conversation on whiteness. We had a conversation on criminal justice reform, right, and how our criminal injustice reform, as Johnny Perez, who's featured in the book, um, would would uh, mention. And you know, these conversations, when you have people coming at these topics from very different backgrounds, perspectives, and lines of work, it's kind of amazing. Um, what emerged. And the whole kind of premise of it was to really get comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? It's uncomfortable talking about race, right? Particularly for white people, but it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable talking about, um, you know, somebody listening to Johnny Perez who served 13 years imprisoned for stealing diapers and formula, nine of which were in solitary. So, um, but to hear Titus Kafar speak on these issues, right? To hear um, Renee Cox, to hear Amir Baradaran talking about the politics of AI and technology. It was really powerful. So it's just this idea that when we bring people like all of us together, we can really serve as a catalyst when we engage across these sort of perceived boundaries with other people in other spaces to really kind of push through uncomfortable terrain and come up with some maybe not answers or solutions, um, but, but ideas, right? And action points. So that is, this book is incredibly close to my heart. I cannot believe that it's coming out right now um, because we need change now, now more than ever. And I'm just so grateful to, to the, you know, 25 contributors from, you know, we talk about food justice, you know, we talk about hashtag feminism. Kimberly Drew has an amazing essay on, on hashtag feminism. So it's just, it's, it's very exciting. And, and my last little, hopefully it doesn't sound like a plug, but the book, it's not theoretical. 
it is very accessible, right? We're not using big words. And when we did in conversation, I would ask the panelists, well, that's interesting. Could you maybe distill that a little bit, open that up a little bit and kind of share a bit more about what that means so that we can kind of embrace everybody in the audience. Um, so yeah, it all kind of ties in. <laughs> I love that. I can't wait to read it over the holidays. Um, and also, I, I love the fact that you said about like loving artists, right? We all love artists. We're, we're, we're you know, we're all in that. So I I wondered um, if um, both Michelle and Laura, you could give a shout out to some artists, designers who you feel are really inspiring in this in this field or, or beyond. Laura, do you want to go first or shall I? Why don't you? Okay, I'll be really fast. Um, I are oh, so, so, so many that I could mention. Um, ones that really are close to my heart in terms of the Designing Motherhood project. I've followed their work for a really long time and they inspired me to think a lot about um, things I want to acquire and display and have conversations about are the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck Hackathon at the MIT Media Lab. Um, so Catherine D'Ignazio, Alexis Hope, and a really um, broad coalition of many different participants. And I like them for two reasons. The first is that they are um, subverting what is usually quite a macho tech heavy um, uh, scenario of the hackathon and um, inviting multiple stakeholders into that conversation. So they really are using a tried and tested way of designing and um, flipping it in order to make it more accessible as a conversation. Um, but what I really love uh, is that they have created a team that is truly interdisciplinary and intersectional to, to look at the problem at hand. Um, so they started in 2014 with um, trying to redesign the breast pump, which does suck and it's not a particularly um, beautiful design. Um, although, you know, it has had some love, more love in the last couple of decades than it has in the last couple of centuries. Um, but they realized very quickly, it wasn't so much about an object and about a system and not just the system of lack of family leave, which which was their second hackathon in 2018, um, but also the ways in which people are empowered to come to the table and be architects and designers of that conversation um, and of responses to it, whether it's new, you know, new questions or solutions. Um, so I have particularly appreciated their research. I think it's fantastic. And that those would be the people I'd call out. I think that a lot of um, people that I migrate towards are current mothers, uh, people in our industry that are simultaneously working and uh, managing their family. Um, Sarit Shani Hay, she's a Tel Aviv based um, Israeli artist who specializes in design for children. And she's been in this space for 20 years and she's a mother of two. And I'm really impressed by the entrepreneurial balance of, and impressed might not be the word, I think it's um, inspired um, because it makes me feel as though it can be done. Um, I feel like in our time and through Art Mamas, I've been really inspired by a number of, you know, female artists and mothers, uh, two of whom are here, Katie and Helen, and, but, but truly, you know, to be able to um, balance family balance, the conversations of being a woman and the challenges that come on deck and how we fold that into our work. Um, I feel frustrated, however, that the conversations are still so archaic. And so I feel like I'm constantly having to explain myself as a mother. And so when it's seamless or we don't know or you know, there's a queer mother or an unconventional trans mother or what have you, the conversations are of, you know, beyond curiosity and shock. And it, it's really frustrating to see that be so shocking at this point. Um, I know that's not a ton of names at the moment, but I feel like I was really caught by the world around me and who I'm seeing, you know, in um, every day from, you know, Liz Collins, who is also um, a stone leaf artist and 
you know, really impressed by the conversations that we have often of how do you balance being a single mother? How do you balance co-parenting? How do you balance all of these different um, elements with your work and then investigate? For me, I've been investigating that through Kinder Modern. It really is a search in my own history of childhood and basically it created a framework of what I wanted to create for my own family through the made goods and, and through looking at the history of that and how unrecognized we've been. Um, Michelle, it's so interesting hearing like we're, when you talk about, and this is a little veered off, but when you talk about, um, you know, like a snapshot of this historical pieces that have supported society and then we have no visual representation there. I think that's just repeated over and over in all the lanes that we occupy. And it's very frustrating. And I hope to really change that. I know when I started with Kinder Modern, there were no pictures of families in glossy decor magazines. And I constantly was asking those same questions, like, where are the kids? Like, where's the fancy room? Like, it's gotta be there. And I think that it's really important to bring all of that forward. Um, so yeah, I'm excited that we're all on the same page with that. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's so nice. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Helen. No, no I just one hundred percent. I agree, and I, I think yeah, it 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 yeah. is about empowering people who have these experiences to remain in the workplace so that they can, along with many other people's experiences of what it is to be alive in the world, um, bring those mm -hmm. experiences to bear on their every day. When I have been in many museum settings, exactly as Isolde said too, um, children are not even like seen and not heard. They are just absent, completely absent. Mm -hmm. Nobody mentions what has happened over the weekend. No one mentions that they have to come in late because they've had a childcare snafu or a dentist or whatever the case may be. Um, and by being sort of endlessly available for work and never ever mentioning the texture of one's life outside of working hours um it allows that absence to perpetuate and so yeah i i, mm -hmm. I again we come back to the systems that then allow that to be possible um because you need to have something there just as a bare minimum to allow those folks um to who have care responsibilities of any kind to be in the workforce to then raise these issues to then have them solved for mm -hmm. I was gonna say one of the things that's so, and I fully agree, Laura, with you and, and Michelle, that's been really interesting as of late, and I can shout out, um, as I'm sure we all can, so many phenomenal um, artists and kind of creative women, um, particularly in our generation, and I imagine that it will, sh it will look even more different right, with the generation coming up behind us. But I think of, you know, Diana Al-Hadid, uh, Zoe Buckman, Wageshi Mutu, Micheline Thomas, and Raquel Chevremont. Um, these are all, you know, pardon my French, but kick-ass working mamas. Um, and just so incredibly inspiring. And I left out so many. I mean, even, even for the generation kind of before us, I think about Deborah Willis, Carrie Mae Weems, you know. So I, I look to those models um, as well as to all of you. Um, but one of the things that's been really interesting as of the, the last five or six months, and Laura, I don't know, or Michelle or Helen or Katie, if you feel this way, sort of in this virtual Zoom kind of space is that we're all, most of us in our homes. And outside of the fact that like, I'm, no one would know sitting on my bed, right? With the nice work of art behind me by Alexandra Penny, um, I'm in my home and there's kind of not a lot that I can do to hide it. Um, you know, my daughter just poked her head in, even though I told her I was going live because she's about to go on a math Zoom. And I kind of gave her the little like that, but she Zoom bombed me a lot over the last five or six months. There's kind of no hiding, you know, um, I'm here, I'm a mom, my kids, you know, learning remotely. And I think between that, between the pandemic, between the election apparently that we still find ourselves in, in this country, and I know there are many elections going on all over the world, and also the fight for racial justice. I have to say, Lori, there's something about what you said that really struck me. And I thought, you know what? I actually feel a little more emboldened. Like I do feel like, you know what? I don't know if I can make that Zoom because I got to get my kid to soccer. So could we push that by an hour? Um, or happy to be on it, but I'll be wearing a mask or I'm just going to dial in because I'm in the park, 
you know, waiting around the field. Like it sort of is what it is, you know, in the same way that I feel, um, you know, very open just about sort of like identifying myself, right? Like I'm a cisgender black woman. Like you're just putting it all out there, right? In a way where previously I felt like, you know, you kind of, we always had to sort of, and women are very good about this because we're very sort of savvy. It's like you sort of tiptoe around certain things if you feel like, oh, that might not really benefit me or maybe I sh sort of shouldn't go there. But now I kind of feel like it's like, you know, hold back nothing you know, lay it out there a little bit in a way. And that's very different. I don't feel as confined as say I did maybe a year ago. So I feel like that's a little bit of, I don't, Laura, I don't know if you feel this way or Michelle, a little bit of progress in that it's, I, I can see Helen even, you know, it's like, it is what it is. It, it just kind of is what it is. Parenting jumped up the ranks a bit, 100%. right? Like the pandemic forced us to bring that as one of our main priorities. And while yeah. I think all of us have had motherhood as a priority even prior to this, I think that it has taken more of a visual, right? Like yeah. we're having it out front and we're less afraid because we are taking the lion's share of pretty much everything. Um, and I think that for me, the step to that ironically was breastfeeding in the beginning because it was something that you just had to do. And it kind of forced me wherever I was to work it out if I, you know, and that's that savvy multitasking right. thing. And then little by little, we got bolder. But what I find now that's also really interesting about um, bringing it up is like being able for me to have it in the home that children have more of a voice in our conversations, right. their needs, their emotional balance is as important as our own. And I think previously that whole seen and not heard thing was literal. Yeah. And it was, you know, that's how I grew up. It was like, yep. Shit, mm, mm, mm. Yep. like, and yep. my kid is really, you know, has a lot of leeway and is beyond a Zoom bomber, you know, to the point where I've been like, bro, like you need to step it back. Like, so it's been interesting finding that balance for me. Um, yeah. But I feel like it's changed me for the better. Mm -hmm. And we are getting stronger because we can see that more and more people need this from us. And those of us that are leaders and will stake that claim and are speaking about taboos like contraptions that support you know, reproductive health or whatever the case may be, like we need to scream that from the rooftops at this point. Mm -hmm. Hashtag feminist. There you go. There you go. So, I think so, that it's happens. so true. Yeah. And I think it happens when people actually reach a breaking point. My theory of activism is not that when things become more permissible, they take up more room. It's when people have had it at the very yeah. last rung. Yeah. And they're like, no, I, I, I have to actively go out. But we saw that this summer, Michelle. Exactly. exactly across exactly. the streets exactly. all over the world exactly right like, like black exactly. lives matter and trans like all over the world yeah. every city from us yeah. you know from sydney to Joburg to nairobi to my hometown yeah. i couldn't believe it yeah. like kampala all over the u.s it's People education had, had enough yeah and I think that traces yeah. back like the historian in me wants to say so when I moved to Boston I'm from the UK and I did not know, not know anything about the city and a lot of people said two things to me and these, these may be the stereotypes of the US you, you will tell me it's 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 uh, maybe true maybe not true but when I moved to Boston the people said you know the weather and I was like I'm Scottish it's fine then they said the racism and I was like wow I did not know that there was a specific city that owned racism in the US I, I feel like maybe it takes on different tenors in different places the thing I know about Boston is where the Combahee River Collective come from. It's where the Boston Women's Health Collective come from. I've always been fascinated by that city because of its activism and the way it connects to my interests of mm -hmm. gender and design. And then I thought, okay, if this is other people's um, awareness of this city and this is the activism that this place has generated, what a tension there is between um, lived experiences and then responses to them. So I really do think that activism, you know, whether or not one city can claim a, a specific um, uh, strand of uh, race relations or not, I do think that um, activism comes from people having no other way to yeah. get what they need to have basic human rights. Yeah, and I just great. want to point out education in a big way. Um, you asked about accessibility before. And for design, it, 
design to the you know layman's terms is always like what is design like how do we explain this concept and you know it's why i focus so much on original works because i feel like there's an arc of education to understanding where works come from who made them how did these get into the world and I feel like when we hear, it kind of is a parallel to when we hear other people stand up for themselves, when we hear, um, when we learn more about the racial tensions and about what's necessary to create balance in all of these different ways, we get educated, which gives us more strength and brevity to speak our own truth and to share our own desires to be better represented to care for our families in a strong way. And so I feel like that educational piece is really important. Um, and I'm learning mm -hmm. here, you know, like hearing from each of you, I will go and Google different things and, you know, add to my repertoire of understanding. And that's what, you know, really enables um, growth, I think. I wanted to Thank you all so much. This has been like, I could talk to you all for hours. You know that. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining today. Oh this has gosh. been thank like, you so, so enlightening. Thank you, all of us. Thank Wishing you. you all really well. Have a good turkey day, whatever that yes. means to all of you, and do something joyful. Yes. I love, I love that. that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Bye. Bye.